Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Dead Addict. Um, my battery life is a little bit low on here. Still trying to get a power cord, so uh, this might die at any moment and become less structured. Wow. I'll answer that. That's my power cord, potentially. Hey there. 4418. It might be coming. All right. <laughs> so I'm dead addict. Um, it's interesting. The the audience for this, obviously, this is a hacker con convention, a hacker conference, and uh, most of my rant is going to be talking to vendors uh, and people that write this buggy software and want to squash this speech. It might not seem like an obvious uh, audience because you're going to find the bugs and humiliate the vendors. But it's, it's my proposition that we're all going to wear many hats, and I know I have in the past. Um, I do consider myself a hacker. Um, I have worked for many, many vendors with many, many security issues. Um, I've been a customer of these uh, vendors, um, and I've also been involved with PR and in media activities. So I think it's inevitable that most of you will have two or three of these hats. So. Um, keep this in mind. If, if you're not a, a vendor currently, there's a good chance you'll be working for one at some point in your career. Um, and what I would hope to do is to convince you to take away some of these lessons and convince people in the organizations you're going to be working for or are working for to do the right thing. Um, I, I don't want to talk about these vendors as unified companies are, are not single entities, just as governments aren't single entities. There's politics within these organizations. There's people within these organizations that are trying to do the right thing. Um, and even when they do the wrong thing, um, there, there's uh, employees and people in these organizations that are really unhappy about that. So. To do the right thing, there's going to be internal battles, and I hope you fight the internal battles and fight your company's politics to, to enable you to do the right thing. Um, I can talk about my qualifications. Um, I've been speaking for a while. I've been involved with DEF CON for a long time. Um, I've worked for large multinational organizations. At the end of the day, all this is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what I've done in the past. What matters is the value of my words, and you can judge that for yourself. Um, and, and there's many more people that have PhD and, and all sorts of wonderful titles and acronyms after their names that say completely bullshit things. So don't listen to them either because of who they are. <clears throat> By the way, I plagiarized that last one. Uh, if anyone can recognize the general gist of that, um, you know who I plagiarized that from. But it was a long time ago, so I think I'm safe. Um, so, like I said, you're... You wear all these hats. Um, you are the hackers. You are finding the bugs. You are the vendors. You are creating the bugs. Um, there's some government folks here. Um, probably not legislature, but um, there's people involved. The government has a lot of rules. Government is actually a customer of, uh, of these bugs. And um, I don't know. I'll give an example. At the end of uh, Michael Lynn's talk at uh, um, Cisco Gate uh, some time ago, um, there are a lot of government agents that were very unhappy. Um, Michael Lynn. <laughs> Michael Lynn was very nervous about that. Um, but they were unhappy at Cisco, it turns out. Um, as customers of the software, they were unhappy that uh, they were not informed about it and that they were vulnerable and Cisco knew about it. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Cisco. I'm going to bring up a bunch of examples of various issues that have happened here. I won't bring up Cisco too much uh, because the darkest of tangents is speaking on that matter in depth in a couple of hours, and it'll be a fascinating speech. I look forward to attending it myself. Um, and I generally don't attend speeches. Uh, I recommend you go to that speech. Also, I very much recommend that you go to the speech two hours ago. That was an excellent speech. Um, that was Jennifer Granick. She gave legal advice, sort of. Um, she talked about the legal environment that exists for security researchers. Um, at some point, uh, her slides will be available. Um, the talk will be available. Uh, I recommend everyone um, understand the legal environment that exists for, for security researchers. Um, one thing uh, Granick said in her Q&A afterwards that I, I thought was uh, remarkable, I, I asked her the question, couldn't most of the speeches that have occurred at um, both Black Hat and DEF CON, couldn't the researchers have been threatened in the way they have in some of these dramatic cases? Isn't all of the stuff we're doing on the gray area where teams of lawyers could go after us? 
Jennifer said, yes, yes, we could all be in trouble for all of this activity, all of this research, all of this um, passionate discovery of issues. Um, and she said it's a credit to the entire industry that uh, more of these incidents haven't happened. So um, I'm going to talk about some bad things that vendors have done, but um, these are dramatic issues. The, the, when vendors mess up, it becomes news. Uh, it becomes newsworthy, and it gets all of our attention. What doesn't get everyone's attention is all the bugs that the vendors deal with appropriately. And most of the time, they do deal with these appropriately, and this is not newsworthy. So uh, just think of all the speeches at all the DEF CONs that have occurred from here in the past and at Black Hat and realize if the vendors were truly the bad guys, they would, um, these conferences wouldn't exist at all and they would be asserting their dubious legal rights uh, to squash all of our speech continually. Um, so most of my speech, like I said, will be focused at the vendors, uh, mainly because they're their decisions to attempt to squash the, the speech of the researchers is uh, the cause of the problems. Um, there's, there's some other problems too. Sometimes the hackers uh, that do this research aren't doing, uh, communicating effectively their case. Um, if, if they were actual bad guys, they wouldn't be up here on stage discussing the vulnerabilities. They would be selling them to Russia or um, hostile governments or our government. Finally, I'm going to talk to a little bit uh, to the media, and I'm going to try to encourage the media to report some of the success stories. It's interesting. The success stories are not discussed, and uh, there's a couple of companies I, I know of and have inside scoops about them dealing with these issues very effectively and doing the right thing and not squashing the research and going through the internal battles legally and uh, telling their companies, look, as, as a security person in my company, if you sick the lawyers on this problem, I'm going to walk away and have nothing to do with you at all. Unfortunately, for some reason, when companies do the right thing, they want to be very quiet about it. <laughs> Um, it turns out that companies want the, uh, to have the option to pursue these dubious legal remedies in the future and essentially the lawyers say, well, even though we haven't won this battle and even though the security researcher in our company said let's not go after this guy, we still want to be able to go after people in the future. So um, don't discuss the fact that we're playing nice. Um, I would hope that that, that changes. Why is this important? Well, at this point in time, the critical infrastructure of the globe is written in software. And if we allow research to be squashed and not be publicly discussed, the research is not going to go away. The true, truly bad guys are going to be pursuing this research and the public safety will be affected. Um, it, the quality of the software and the quality of the, the security industry um, depends on open discourse. Um, I, I, wanna, I don't want to beat up on the vendors to say they're, they're doing the bad thing for ethical and moral reasons, although in many of these cases I believe they are acting uh, unethically and immorally. But what instead I want to do, instead of just beating up on the, the vendors, is I want to convince them that this isn't in their best interest. Um, their best interest is to have a positive relationship with security researchers, to encourage uh, security researchers to come to them with issues, um, and to essentially have some harmony with the hacker and security community. Um, not for altruistic purposes, but because it's good for their product, it's good for their customers, and it's good for their reputation. Um, yeah, also, I want these conferences to continue. As I mentioned before, if uh, um, these organizations uh, continue to assert dubious uh, legal rights and, and uh, threaten us all, um, all these conferences can go away. And uh, that wouldn't be any fun for any of us. So when I talk about dropping the zero day, uh, or when I talk about picking up the zero day, it's largely not not exactly zero day I'm talking about. There's no announcement of zero day. If you're dropping a zero day, if, you're, if you just release something, it's largely too late for the corporations to do anything about it. Um, so that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about announcing uh, you're going to release research, um, which is a very legitimate thing to do. You know, you, um, Professor Felton was going to uh, release some research at an uh, academic conference, and he announced he was going to do so before. 
announcing your research before you uh, publish it is a very legitimate thing to do. Um, but essentially, this is um, this is about not asking the vendor's permission beforehand, and and what happens at that point. Um, it's it's interesting too. In the HID case, uh, very much confused me and blew me away. Um, and so many of these cases are the thing that bewilders me is how much it's not in the vendor's uh, self-interest. So I'm, I'm going to refer to a number of cases here where you can do a lot of research to get the background on them. I don't want to go into detailed case studies about them. But uh, HID makes uh, proximity badges. And um, there was going to be uh, some demonstrations of uh, how to clone these proximity badges. And uh, IOActive, the company that did this research, um, was concerned because they lived in, or they worked in a building where there was critical infrastructure housed. They realized it was protected by something that was not secure. What confused me about this was twofold. Um, one, this research was already done. People had made these uh, badge copiers. The academic research was out there. Schematics were already available. Um, I respect um, very much the people at IOActive, the work they do. There's some brilliant people there. But as far as I could uh, uh, determine, it wasn't entirely um, groundbreaking research. Um, so they, the HID attempted and succeeded in stopping a talk of, of information that was already known. The second thing that bewildered me about this is HID, as a vendor, had solutions to the problem. Right? The, the, the technology that was going to be released, they had more secure versions that would allow um, better access control, and their marketing people should have stepped up to the plate and realized this is a better way to upgrade all their user base, uh, or at least at critical infrastructure, and, and they didn't do so. So because of my modesty, I'm going to tell everyone what to do. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I think, like I said, I'm not going to tell everyone to, what to do because it's the right thing to do, although I believe it is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to tell everyone what the right thing to do that's in their own uh, self-interest. Um, and it's in the interest of consumers, of vendors, of hackers, of everyone, um, except uh, some uh, offensive folks uh, in the government. I'm sure you're, uh, you won't be spotted here. Um, and uh, corporate lawyers whose billable hours... Uh, um, make them a lot of money harassing security researchers. The problem, the problem with these threats, with these legal threats, is it's chilling to free speech. And this is of, of great concern to me. If we don't have discussions of problems in the products we all use, then we won't be able to make informed decisions on which products to buy, which products to purchase. As customers, we won't be able to pressure the vendors to fix their products. Um, and again and again and again, the companies, after all this happened, try to backtrack about what their actual stance was. We weren't trying to squash this research. HID, when they sent their uh, threatening letter saying they would use every legal remedy at the available, um, later said, no, 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 we didn't say don't do the presentation. Um, but yet, I didn't quite parse the words uh, uh, that way. And uh, looking at their, their actual threats, it seemed to me that indeed um, they succeeded in chilling the speech. The fact is, um, when the companies make the, when the vendors make the poor decisions, when the um, vendors decide to be confrontational, um, they they are squashing free speech, and um, I believe they're squashing our First Amendment rights. Um, Jennifer Granick in her talk a couple of hours ago talked about a litany of tools that could be used against security researchers, and there's a lot of law involved. Um, like I said, I, I'm going to try not to give anyone legal advice whatsoever. Um, and Jennifer actually didn't give anyone legal advice, but she was the expert. So definitely listen to her. It, it, it doesn't matter. The, 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 one of the other problematic things about these legal threats that the, these organizations um, pursue against researchers is even if the researcher would prevail in a court of law, even if the law at the end of the day would be on their side, 
it, it doesn't matter because the defense costs, and, and IO Active is an excellent, excellent example, they're a small company. Just to defend themselves and to litigate the matter, which um, many, many people believe they would have uh, prevailed in, it would have possibly destroyed their company. Um, and if, if they lost, um, they certainly would have been de uh, demolished as a small company. And a lot of the most interesting research uh, that's not being done independently is being done by small firms, small security firms uh, such as IOActive. Also, it, these threats don't help the security posture of the industry. Lawyers can't fix bugs. Lawyers do not make us safer. Um, I, I guess I would argue some of the civil libertarians uh, that are here do, do make us safer. Um, Jennifer Granick, the EFF, um, there, there's some good folks here. I think everyone loses um, when we're silenced. And hopefully we can create an approach and fight, fight these battles internally to, to prevent uh, everyone from doing the wrong thing. As I mentioned before, I believe this is a public safety issue. Um, and the previous, I, I, Granick mentioned in her speech um, that unsafe at any speed would not be allowed if the car manufacturers were to say, well, you can't discuss this vulnerability and this danger in our cars. Um, people would die because of it. And that's sort of a dramatic thing to say people would die, but the software uh, in question and the software that runs our world is, is running our critical infrastructure. Hospitals are running this code. Um, public safety uh, institutions are running this code. The most bewildering thing about this is that when companies do attempt to squash research, it doesn't work. They fail miserably. Um, many of these talks, uh, the IOActive one, for example, I don't think that would have generated much press. Um, with all due respect uh, to, to IOActive, um, I don't think it was that dramatic or groundbreaking of work. Uh, it was only when the legal threats were created that suddenly those schematics, schematics that were uh, online for a long time were suddenly accessed and referenced and talked about, and people suddenly had a lot of interest in these products um, and, and these vulnerabilities. Um, and people that couldn't understand uh, uh, Michael Lynn's talk uh, uh, were downloading and mirroring this all over the globe. And that wouldn't have happened if there weren't legal threats. And the internet does really uh, a wonderful job at distributing information when, when there's threats of censorship. And I don't think the PR folks at the organizations that have made these poor decisions understand this. I don't think the lawyers understand this. It's not good business for anyone. Um, and I, I'm, I'm honestly baffled that people still continue to attempt to squash this research. Even, even if they could squash it, even if the entire public did not realize these vulnerabilities, even if they were able to prevent it from uh, making the Wall Street Journal and whatnot, um, there's no reason not to believe this information still wouldn't be disseminated in the underground, um, in which case the, the customers would, be, um, would lose even more. But, by the way, I like the idea of using uh, very bright people and well-respected people to make my points. I, I, I think that's a, a lovely method. It's so hard in any relationship to, uh, to, to build trust. And um, many of these organizations depend on independent security researchers from con to contact them and to point out issues that occur. And uh, I think the, the month of Apple bugs is an excellent example of what happens when uh, uh, a vendor uh, has poor relationships with the security community, the security community, instead of going to the vendor now, will very often say, you know what, I'm just going to release this, and it, it doesn't really matter. Um, working with a vendor is, is, is going to be counterproductive. I mentioned some of these. Um, Adobe uh, versus Elcomsoft, it wasn't necessarily about uh, uh, squashed uh, research that was being presented, but it, it certainly was an attempt by a corporation to, to stop uh, research uh, being published into their work. So it was a very interesting case. Um, 
the SDMI versus Professor uh, Felton was an excellent example of not only so-called hackers uh, doing this research, but very well-esteemed, respected academics doing this research and still feeling um, as if their research was being squashed and, and successfully so. Man. Oh. So a number of years ago, I would say seven, eight years ago, Microsoft had uh, uh, an incredibly poor reputation uh, in regards to uh, not only their security profile, uh, and their security stance, um, their security methodology, um, but also their relationship with the community. Um, and Microsoft, uh, in the last five years, while their software isn't necessarily secure, they are surprisingly a leader in um, secure development uh, life cycles um, uh, with community relationships with hackers. Um, and they haven't, they haven't had any of these incidences that I'm going to describe. They've been doing the right thing. Um, I'm not endorsing their software. <laughs> But um, I'm just saying, if Microsoft gets it right, why can't, why can't everyone else? It's, it's possible that there are actual tools that can be used to uh, successfully to squash this research. It's possible that the law is on, on the side of the vendors in many of these cases. And the lawyers and the internal discussions that these organizations have present these options, these business options, um, to, to, uh, to the vendors to decide whether or not they're going to attack the, the research or not. But they're not attacking the right people. The people that are going public and publicly disclosing these issues, um, they're not the enemy. The, the enemy are the people that are selling uh, these exploits to people that will commercially profit from them um, and selling them to, to governments that will use them for offensive uh, purposes and, and whatnot. Vendors do appreciate the research uh, that independent hackers do. Um, they come to these uh, conferences, they send their folks to them, they sit in the rooms, um, they take notes, they talk to them afterwards. I've seen this again and again. But they seem to expect that the research should be done on their own terms. They're very happy to get free work. But the fact is you can't get free work from people um, and then expect uh, everything to be on your own terms. I'm not going to discuss uh, in depth the disclosure debate. Um, that's been uh, what appropriate disclosure is. That's an ongoing discussion that, that's kind of interesting, but it's been happening for half a dozen years or more. Um, but I, I would like to point out that when someone contacts uh, an organization uh, and says, hey, I have, I have an exploit, uh, I, I found some problem in your software, it's, it's really inappropriate for the organization to expect the hacker to start doing full-time volunteer work for the large multinational. Um, you can have it one way or the other. Again, the customers don't like this. The customers don't like to be vulnerable. Um, they don't care how the problem was found. Um, they know that lawyers are not going to solve their problems or as customers, will, they won't protect them. They need the bugs fixed. And um, I, I think it looks really bad as an organization when uh, essentially you panic. And I, I, think, I think you can characterize uh, some of these litigious uh, attacks on researchers as corporate panic. And as a customer, when I see my vendor panic, that doesn't instill confidence in me at all. Uh, what instills confidence in me is the vendor saying, oh, yes, that was an excellent issue. Yeah, we're looking into that. Here's our response. Here's immediately, we're going to tell you how to mitigate the threat. It's a valid threat. Here's how to mitigate it. We're not worried about it at all. Um, we're going to get a patch very quickly, um, and it's all good. That's a response, I think, as a customer that I can have some confidence in. Um, when, when a vendor says oh my God, what did they release? We're all in trouble. That terrifies me as a customer. That's not good. Also, man. So, of all the people the vendors could piss off in the world, a conference full of hackers is probably the wrong decision. When you antagonize and attack a researcher, maybe 
you can get them to shut up. Maybe that research is, is affiliated with a, a company that doesn't want to go under because of legal threats. The problem is there's suddenly an audience of 5,000 hackers that may have some free time on their hand and not be afraid of the litigation. Maybe they live in another country. Maybe they're not affiliated with a company. Maybe they're 16 years old and still can reproduce the bug. Um, you, you don't, you don't want to upset us. It's, it's not wise. Um, and, and if you do upset us, we're not going to give you that free research. We're not going to help you out. We're not going to work with you in a constructive manner. If they were the bad guys, if we were the bad guys, uh, we would never tell anyone. And certainly, that's what black hats do. Black hats find these holes, they find these security issues, and then they keep them in their private arsenal. The private arsenal becomes useless once you release the bug to the public. Um, it's counterproductive for doing bad things when everyone knows about this. Ah, excellent. This tastes better than water. So, <clears throat> a company will often say internally, what are our options? And unfortunately, this is not the conversation they often have with their PR folks or their security folks. They'll, they'll have this conversation with their lawyers. The lawyers know how to litigate. That's their job. They know how to create billable hours. Um, their job is not to create a, a positive PR stance. Their job is not to fix software. Their job is not to look at the larger ramifications of how their reputation will be impacted. Um, if you come to a problem with a lawyer, to a lawyer and say, how can I stop this or what are my legal options, all they're going to give you is legal options. So by the mere fact of engaging uh, within a corporation as this disclosure process is occurring, the mere act of engaging the lawyers the lawyers are going to give you legal remedies and they might find a large arsenal of uh, possible issues um, uh, bogus patent claims um, claiming reverse engineering is illegal claiming that EULAs are binding even though the software was sold third party or was a click through um, they might find many novel legal theories that are untested and inappropriate but that's all they're going to do Yeah, this is the big one. Well, one of the big ones. It, if you want to appear on the front page of the Wall Street Journal in a negative light, um, you will threaten a security researcher. If you want to appear in the Associated Press uh, in a negative light and have your bugs disclosed, uh, you will threaten a security researcher. The press doesn't want stories about people getting together and getting along and everything working out fine and, and a smooth process between hackers and companies. It's generally not a story. Um, I mean, it, it might be a good in-depth story, and, and I hope some reporters take up this challenge, and I hope uh, some of the companies are willing to share some of their stories of working with hackers, because it happens on a daily basis. But the press is event-oriented, um, so talking about good things that happen is not really an event. Um, a, a large legal threat against a small person, that's a story. That's a juicy story that a non-technical person can be interested in. That's a story that will sell newspapers. That's a story that will get picked up by the AP. And then it's not good for the vendor. The thing is, no matter how bad the bug is, um, that's not the story. The, sto the story is the suppression of the bug. The story is of the company panicking. Even, even if it is a serious issue, even if there is a large problem, if the vendor is not panicking, um, th there really isn't good press there. Oh, yeah, again, um, when you attempt to squash these stories, suddenly the entire world is aware of the specific bug you want to squash. And what's that? <laughs> yeah, like I said, see Dark Tangents talk for more discussion of Cisco. <laughs> um, now, so I, I, I talked a lot about what not to do as an organization and why this is not the appropriate response for vendors, why not to be confrontational. What you need to do is you need to let cooler heads prevail. 
You need to, even if uh, it was an inappropriate disclosure, even if the security researcher was not savvy in how they handled it, even if they were perhaps inflammatory in their rhetoric and said bad things about you as a company, um, confronting them in a negative way is not going to help this, the situation at all. Engaging the researcher is going to help the situation. Um, finding out more about the bug, uh, finding out more about these issues. Um, and, and as you're interacting with these researchers, just remember that your threats will be published. Your legal threats are pieces of news. Um, remember every email that you send out to this person, particularly if uh, you have a confrontational uh, approach to the situation, very well might appear in the press. And, and I think that might be appropriate. Microsoft has learned, and other companies have learned, um, if you just look at the sponsors of the Black Hat Conference, uh, if you look at all the corporate parties, which tend not to be that good, quite honestly, but they try, so, so I appreciate that. Um, all these companies realize that establishing a relationship with a computer security community is advantageous to them. Um, the people that are finding bugs in their software could be future employees. The people researching their, their, their software um, could be uh, customers of theirs in the future. Um, and, and there's a lot, lot of corporations um, that have realized having um, a successful relationship with a security community is a positive thing. Um, while, while I didn't hear good things about the Cisco party uh, this year at Black Hat, the, the fact is they were um, uh, a sponsor of Black Hat, and they, they did throw a party, and, and they tried. Um, and I think that's, that's a positive step. And, and I think a, a lot of these companies that have made mistakes in the past can rectify them, um, can try to have a better stance. Um, it takes time to rebuild the, these trust issues. Um, after you've stumbled, people will distrust you for a while. But, you know, it's interesting, looking at uh, the Microsoft uh, story, um, the perception of the security community regarding Microsoft's stance on security is much larger now than the general public as a rule. Uh, the, the general public as a whole still sees the bugs that are being created. They're still nervous about them. They remember when, secure, the, when Microsoft didn't have any security stance. But as a whole, the security community realizes that there's a commitment to security. And that commitment to security is what everyone wants. The government wants this because their critical infrastructure is running on this. The customers want this. Um, the hackers want this. The hackers want these bugs fixed. We're running this software. The, the, the software we're exploiting, we're also using. Um, the reason why we scream up and down, scream loudly and jump up and down regarding these bugs is because we want the world to be a safer place. Ah, Bruce is very quotable. Ah, I might not run out of power yet. Excellent. Thank you. So I think it's important. Just a sec. Let me plug this in a sec. We'll wait till we see some scary blinking lights before I find the plug for that. I, I've I've found issues uh, uh, as a customer, and and uh, many vent software vendors, when they're alerted to these security issues by their customers, are very uh, they'll fix it very quickly. Um, customers, you need to be savvy about the security stance of the the companies you're buying from, um, and. Having a bad relationship with the security community it, uh, is not the only problem. I think that's indicative of a larger problem that your entire security stance and your your attitude towards security is uh, is not a good one. And I think customers need to look at some of these incidents. Ah, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> I found a plug that's in the podium. Would that uh the right one? No, no, it, it it's the right cable. Okay. All right. See how that works. 
works. Yeah, I think I'm uh, good to go now. <laughs> we'll see in a second. Okay, let's see if I can continue without my haphazard, uh, poorly written slides. I think I'll be able to. Um, maybe a few less uh, glorious Schneier uh, quotes. Um, it, it, as customers, it's your responsibility to make intelligent purchasing decisions. And uh, while some vendors will not have a good security stance, some vendors will have a better stance. And I think these are the ones you want to look to in your buying decisions. Um, I think it's terribly important as customers that you give feedback to the vendors. The vendors like to hear from their customers and will largely do what they're told. Um, if you talk to, to the marketing people, if you talk to the people, particularly after you bought licenses, you know, if you bring up concerns and if you say this is a deciding factor in my purchasing decisions, they listen to that. Their company depends on customers. And flexing your power as a customer is an excellent way to help uh, companies and vendors uh, better uh, increase their security stance. And arguably, it's your responsibility as customers to complain loud enough to make these changes. That was one reason why Microsoft finally drank the security Kool-Aid, is they got enough negative feedback from all of their customers that said, look, no matter how usable your software is, it's so insecure, we're not going to use it anymore. We can't. And uh, you know, it was, a, it was a long process for, for such a large organization to, to try to improve their uh, security stance and their security development life cycle. Yeah, question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, so yeah, you have an impact. And if, if as a customer you're dealing with an organization and a vendor that doesn't make uh, uh, good security decisions, it's sort of your fault as a customer. Um, don't be the victim. Don't be victimized by the people you buy your software from. And your, your voice in the market can and will make a difference. So I'm going to move on to... to talk a little bit about hackers. Ah, 10 minutes. And what 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 y'all should do. Now, in some of these cases, like, like I mentioned, it, some disclosure is arguably inappropriate or done in a hostile manner. The fact is, if you're releasing this publicly, right, if you're releasing these vulnerabilities publicly, I say you're not the bad guy because you would be doing other things with this vulnerability. You'd be keeping it private. You'd be selling it to people with nefarious ends and means. Um, so by the mere fact of publicly disclosing and shouting, hey, there's a problem here, um, you are the good guy. Now, now that you're the good guy, you should probably be careful of your rhetoric. You know, I told the vendors to be careful. All the emails they, they write might be used against them. Well, also, all the public statements that uh, you as a researcher make, um, think about how the press will react to that. Think about the tone of your language. Um, write your, your descriptions of these issues as if you're trying to help the world, because I posit you are trying to help the world. And I think, um, particularly when the press get involved in these stories with confrontations, uh, when the hackers who are doing the right things say inflammatory things, they don't look good. And they should. And you should. And, and being really careful, ask some advice uh, before sending emails out. Ask your friends about the language you use. Um, th this will impact the public perception of you, and, and that's really important. Um, it's important that we are recognized as helping uh, global security, because we are as publicly uh, disclosing these vulnerabilities. Um, oh, seek legal advice um, when you get scared. Now, I'm going to quote uh, um, Gail Thackeray, who is a prosecutor involved with Operation Sun Devil, um, which happened some time ago. Gail Thackeray once said to me, drug dealers give themselves better legal advice than hackers do. So, when you're, when you're curious or concerned about what the legal impact of something is, do not ask your hacker friends. <laughs> they will not help you at all. The, the, the advice to trust when you, when you go to your hacker friends, the only advice I would say to trust, um, you know, what should I do? I'm scared about some legal repercussions of something. The answer you trust is call Jennifer Granick. <laughs> now, she's not very scalable, so thankfully the EFF exists. 
And even more thankfully, she's going to work for the EFF so she can work full time uh, uh, protecting our, our civil liberties, our electronic civil liberties. Um, but if you're concerned, uh, 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 see a lawyer and uh, see a good lawyer. Uh, and the EFF uh, may not. Oh, don't count on them. <laughs> now, uh, someone uh, uh, just a few minutes ago complained that the that the EFF was not representing every hacker that ever got in trouble. Well, I don't think they should. <laughs> if you go hacksaw the Gibson and then you get caught and then you run to the EFF and say, "Help, help! I'm being prosecuted." You broke the law. There's what's your defense exactly? Now, when an organization comes and uh, uh, exercises legal threats of uh, uh, dubious value towards you, that's a that's a worthy case. And uh, at the very least, uh, it's entirely likely they'll they'll give you some advice. Not necessarily represent you, but but give you some advice. Um, but certainly, don't count on any of these organizations. Um, it's not their responsibility to defend all of us in in all of the legal adventures we might get into. Um, finally, just have a couple minutes left here. I'd like to address the press. I mentioned before that controversy sells. These things are event oriented, right? When when a big event occurs, that becomes the story. Um, it would be nice. Well, a I would like you to to realize that even if the hackers are not well-versed in uh, uh, speaking in a manner that makes themselves look good, right? The corporation has an army of PR folks. They, they train their folks on how to communicate successfully. Just because the hacker does not necessarily speak uh, successfully and communicate successfully, keep in mind the fact that they're public about their disclosure, the fact that they're not selling it to the bad guys, they're not keeping it in their private arsenal, that makes them good guys. Now, some inflammatory rhetoric, that makes them inept good guys, but they're still good guys. So keep this in mind as, as you're covering some of these controversies. Also, I would greatly appreciate it uh, if the press out there would cover some of the stories of the good guys. Um, some of these, um, you know, for every speech that occurs at DEF CON, um, you know, 99% of them don't have legal action taken against them. And oftentimes, there's panic within organizations. I've been involved in some of this panic. I've been sitting in the front row um, as, a, as a vendor, um, scribbling, taking notes furiously, and paging people and whatnot. Um, but we did the right thing, but it wasn't a story. It was a non-event because there was no conflict. If you can do some investigation, investigation and find some of these cooperation stories, I think it, it makes for interesting reading, and I think it might help set an example for other customers and other vendors uh, and, and everyone else. Also, um, I don't know. To yeah, I, I would like to speak to to the government. Um, I would like to tell them to, to help out in these situations. In the case of Michael Lynn, uh, in the Cisco case, they were very supportive, but it was largely moral support. Um, unfortunately, the legal tools that were being levied against many of these researchers in many of these cases were written out by the legislature. So um, contact your legislature when you contact your congressmen, your senators, when you see laws that are being drafted up in regards to uh, the cyber arena uh, and cybersecurity in particular, and voice your concerns uh, as constituents. And, and don't just put it, don't frame these letters in the light of this is wrong because it's wrong. Frame it in the right of the the light of it. It will harm our infrastructure. Uh, we're concerned as customers. Um, the overall quality of software will not improve if if this legislation is is enacted. Um, ultimately, uh, we're supposed to be a democracy, so uh, I would hope that uh, participating in, in a democracy can help impact uh, uh, positive change and and uh, revoking some of these uh, dubious uh, legal methods used to squash some of this research. Um, I'm going to uh, spend some time um, in the Q&A room. I have three minutes left, so uh, I'll take questions and be open for discussions uh, next door um, in room four, in the Q&A room four. Uh, also, uh, during the conference, uh, feel free to come up to me and uh, buy me a drink and ask me more questions. <laughs> Oh, finally, uh, one, one other message, a little bit off topic. Uh, oh, if anyone, uh, my email address is daddict, D-A-D-D-I-C-T, at gmail.com. Also, 
A large number of us on Sunday night are going to uh, uh, the Penn and Teller show at the Rio. So I thought it'd be a lot of fun if uh, half their audience was uh, flashing uh, flashy badges. Um, so if you want to join us there, that'd be a lot of fun. So thanks much.